Well, hello, good afternoon, and welcome back to another episode of One in 70 Second What If Craziness. Now, I'm busy constructing some aircraft here. I've got another F 44.5 to finish, F 16, an Eagle, Growler, loads of stuff going on. But um, a subscriber has made a comment or asked a question, and I always like it when subscribers um give me decent uh ideas um because one it fires my brain um means i can go and do some research maintain my interest in warfare and two uh, it gives me ideas for what to build so whoever you are thank you for the idea the question was around nautical strike it was around vulcans and cold war nautical strike and it, it got me thinking about a basic core doctrine of the what if Malagasy Armed Forces. This is all what if, um, so it, it, it's not, you know, um, serious. But um, I've taken the premise that uh, Madagascar, the Malagasy Armed Forces, uh, struck oil in the 50s and 60s, uh, became a great power regionally and um, developed strong air force and military, which allows me to model it. Um, I don't model um, actual real military stuff, really, because of politics and I have to stay non-political for my job and various other reasons so I hope that makes some sense so that's why I chose Madagascar uh, also because of the movie with penguins um, but anyway here we go so um, nautical strike is a matter of life and death for the Malagasy armed forces now let's um, keep our definition of war around Clausewitz's because I think it's the best the objective of war is to disarm your enemy and compel them to do your political will. And Madagascar is, of course, an island. So the easiest way to compel um, Madagascar to do your political will, if you mean Madagascar harm, is to blockade it, surround it and uh, disarm it. So nautical strike protection of an island nation is a matter of life and death. So let's have a look at what's going on in the world at the minute. We've, got, of course, got the Russia-Ukraine war and um, various attacks on the Black Sea fleet by Ukraine, which I believe is a sh side show. Sorry to disappoint you. I don't think it's going to win Ukraine war anytime soon. But nautical matters and matters to do with the Navy are a matter of life and death. So in World War II, the Battle of the Atlantic and the U-Boat War the U-boat war was an attempt by Nazi Germany to compel Britain to do its political will by isolating them and cutting them off. The Battle of the Atlantic, I believe, was where the war was won. It was won by defeating the U-boat threat, allowing the convoys to get through to keep Britain in the war. If we look at um, another naval war, we look at the Falklands War. Britain was able to isolate the Malvinas or the Falklands um, and it did this by a one ship, showing that one ship does do plenty. And that one ship was HMS Conqueror. So HMS Conqueror sunk the Belguerano, which meant that the Argentine carrier, the Il de Mayo, did not take part in the conflict. If it had, it could have really changed the balance of the conflict. Now, naval war is expensive. Um, ships are vulnerable. And losses are incurred. The fact that Russia is losing its Black Sea fleet is nothing unusual. It's moored up in harbour. It's in a confined space. It's operating within a small geographical area. It's losing a lot of ships. In the Falklands, the British task force lost a lot of ships, particularly when they went into the landing zones, San Carlos, Buffs Clove. And the difference between a great naval power and what I'd call an also-run naval power is the ability to influence battle in the deep ocean. There's very few nations that can do that. And the Malagasy Armed Forces have to be prepared to influence battle in the deep ocean. If we look at where this was done most successfully in World War II in the Pacific Campaign, Midway, Coral Sea, Leyte Gulf and Truk Lagoon was where the Americans really won 
the Battle of the Pacific. Pearl Harbour failed because the carriers were missed and, in many ways, like what's happening with the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, it was a side show. And the Japanese commander knew that when they missed the carriers. So nautical strike for an island nation like Malagasy, Madagascar is life and death. So here is a not to scale drawing of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. Now, identifying the main threats to Madagascar is quite easy. The main threat and the only global superpower at the minute is the United States. The only country that could isolate Madagascar, cut it off, blockade it, surround it and compel them to do their will is the United States, who are thankfully an ally. China in 2030 probably will be able to do this. India maybe in the future, yes. But at the minute, the only power in the world that can do this is the United States, which is reassuring because... It keeps Madagascar relatively safe, having them as an ally. But you never know what might come around the corner. So nautical strike is important, and it is, like I said, a life or death. Now, you notice I've not put Russia on here. Uh, I don't believe Russia is a great maritime power. It operates in very constrained seas. I would say it's got the ability to do damage with submarines, but it could not isolate, blockade, surround and invade Madagascar in the way that the Americans could with their carrier groups and amphibious groups. Now, if we look at where Madagascar sits, it sits in a strategic location off the south coast of Africa. We all know what's happening up here towards Saudi Arabia, Somalia, into the Red Sea with the Houthis. Now, trade comes mainly from China, from the Pacific, through the Indian Ocean, up towards the Suez Canal. The secondary trade route, and the one that's having to be used more at the minute, goes underneath Madagascar, around the coast of South Africa, and that is becoming more important. So like I said, being able to operate in the sea is a matter of life and death. Now, what I'm going to say is nautical strike in the Malagasy Armed Forces Doctrine is not the job of the Malagasy Navy. And I'll explain why. So the Malagasy What If Navy is quite well equipped, uh, way more equipped than it actually is in real life. But bear with me. So here we are in What If Land. Two fleet carriers, one active at sea training, one resting, refitting, 54 Rafale M's, 36 Marine Skyhawks, 9 Hawkeyes, 36 Seahawks, 18 AB412 uh, ASWs, and most importantly, 9 Sea Hercules and 6 Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft. 27 Tomcats, which provide cover over the anchorages, the anchorages are mainly in the north, so they provide air defence cover here. Six air defence destroyers, Type 45s. Nine frigates, Type 23s. Nine Type 212 submarines from Germany. 18 mine counter ships and 27 missile boat corvettes, supply vessels and other things. So that's the Madagascar What If Navy. One day I hope to build all of this in one three fiftieth, but that's a long time away. If I start buying ships, my wife will give me divorce papers. So let's look at the sea and let's look at the threat. Well, the reason the Navy is not involved in nautical strike is the job of the Navy, if there ever was a big war, is to be nowhere near Madagascar with its fleet carriers. If you operate carriers in a confined geographical space, you are effectively like fish in a barrel for the enemy. So the job of the two fleet carriers and their battle groups is actually to go to choke points. 
we take it that the enemy is going to be a power like America or America. The first choke point is down here below Africa. Second point is here where the Indian Ocean meets the South China Sea, the Pacific, that area there. And the next choke point is up here as you head towards the Suez Canal. Now this one is where the subs will go. Subs will go here, top end of Madagascar, bottom end of Madagascar. The job of nautical strike isn't to the Navy because the Navy's job is to take these choke points and cut off the trade routes and hit what could be an American task force from behind or keep them tied up, keep them active, keep them moving around, keep them busy, hit and run attacks using the Rafales, which do have anti-ship missiles. The maritime patrol aircraft take this area around the home waters, in particular the gap between Africa and Madagascar. If you can keep this open, you can keep trade going. So that's where the bulk of the maritime patrol aircraft operations are. They're around stopping enemy subs from cutting this vital strait. The job of the nautical strike forces is to operate at long range into this gap, medium range into this gap, medium range here into the Indian Ocean and long range towards the edge of the Indian Ocean. Basically making any enemy attempts to build up an amphibious task force or blockade force in this area too costly and hitting their supply routes. So nautical strike is not the job of the Malagasy Navy. So let's have a look at what nautical strike is. Well, firstly, we have to say that ships are basically giant tin cans. When I went to university, I had a fantastic lecturer called Andrew Lambert. Uh, basically, a ship is a giant, vulnerable tin can. Modern ships are not armoured like World War II ships. They don't have the plate armour, but they are heavily compartmentalised. A ship is vulnerable to two things. They don't like water going inside of them, tends to sink them. And they don't like catching fire, which also tends to sink them. So, what do the Madagascar forces have to overcome? Well, whilst the ship is a giant tin can, and they literally are tin cans, they are protected by lots of systems. So if we take this enemy navy ship here, it has close-in weapon systems. So these are your fast-firing chain guns that fire along at water level and into the air, basically to take out missiles. They have decoys countermeasures that operate in this short range. Further out, you've got the surface-to-air missiles. Further out, you've got electronic countermeasures, electronic signals. And then protecting them often in the case of any threat to the Malagasy island, you would have enemy carrier air groups providing an outer shield. Underneath the water, these vulnerable tin cans are also protected. Towed sonar away, arrays, sonars on the ship, and helicopter dipping sonar to deal with submarine threat. So whilst the actual ship is highly vulnerable to missiles, getting near it is difficult. So here we have to look at what approaches have been developed to attack these ships and deliver a nautical strike to keep an island nation safe. Well, the main approach is the Soviet approach. And it feeds into the Swedish, Norwegian and the Japanese Defence Force approach. They're all variations on a theme. So the Soviet Navy uh, realised that it could not be a great naval power. Didn't have the carrier battle groups, doesn't have the resources and it's not doctrinally inclined to naval warfare. In fact, if you go back through Russian and Soviet naval history, it's a history of repeated defeat. They are a land power, not a naval power. So they developed a doctrine of being able to defeat the American and British, mainly American, carrier battle groups. And they did this with long-range bombers. So this is where you have the TU-22K blinder. You have the TU-22M3 
backfire and you have the TU 95s and you have before that the TU 16 to a degree. Now the Chinese have kind of taken this approach as well. So the long range bombers they fire multiple waves of anti ship missiles in the case of the backfires, three massive missiles per launch aircraft. Squadrons of these firing multiple waves of missiles. They then have missile boats like the OSA and its uh, newer versions. They have submarines and they're basically firing multiple waves of missiles at the US carriers. And the reason they're doing that is because back in the day, now gone, you had the Tomcats, you've still got the Hawkeyes, you've got the Hornets, you've got the closing weapon systems and you've got the SAMs. The Soviet doctrine was basically to absolutely overwhelm the US carrier group, just totally overwhelm it. We're talking of salvos of 60 odd missiles. Now, of course, closer in, you've got coastal defense batteries such as the Bastion and uh, Onyx and other uh, coastal defense missile and gun systems. Uh, to, to a degree, Sweden, Norway, um, the Japanese do the same thing, but with smaller aircraft. Aircraft like the Gripen, the Vigan, um, the F-2 now for Japan. It was the F-1 uh, previously, the sort of trainer, which uh, was an anti-ship missile carrier. And they used the RBS-15 and the ASM-2. So this is the approach that the Malagasy Armed Forces will also be taking. Because if you can overwhelm this carrier group at long range, you might get... 50 of your 60 missiles shot down but your 10 remaining missiles if they hit their target given the power of modern anti-ship missiles given the vulnerability of the tin cans you will make attacking your island utterly utterly unworkable so 10 hits on a u.s carrier battle group say two on the carrier two on the cruisers and the rest on the escorting destroyers, you would effectively put that battle group out of action. You have to do it by overwhelming force. You can't do it by single nice little shots. It has to be absolutely overwhelming. So that's the doctrine that the Malagasy Armed Forces are working to. So the plan and the reason why it doesn't include the Navy is because the Navy needs to get uh, away from Dodge. The Navy needs to go out and strike the attacking forces supply lines harass them, get its battle groups away from the confined waters.